Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my history series or if you're new here, welcome. Today we've got an episode that I originally planned on uploading well over a month ago but this one has proved so tricky for me to research. I just couldn't bring myself to write about this for long periods of time because of the sheer extent of this tragedy. It was a really really difficult one for me so this is your warning, this is going to be a particularly heavy story today. I really considered just stopping my research multiple times for this one because it was rough but then I remind myself that people actually lived through this and I think it's a story that needs to be told and it's a request from you guys that have had more times than I can count. Today we're talking about the new London school gas explosion or gas disaster from 1937 where around 300 children and teachers died as a result of the third deadliest disaster in the history of Texas. The second largest disaster was the 1947 Texas City disaster when a fire aboard the ship the SS Grand Camp docked in the port caused the ship's cargo of ammonium nitrate to detonate, starting this chain reaction of fires and explosions on other ships and oil storing facilities nearby. 581 people died. The largest disaster was the 1900 Galveston hurricane which is said to have killed anywhere from 6 to 8,000 people. The New London School Gas Explosion is number three on this list with around 300 deaths. On the back of this disaster, laws were changed first in Texas and then around the whole world. Laws which have undoubtedly saved hundreds of thousands if not millions of lives since then. In the 1930s, there was a worldwide period of economic depression after a major fall in stock prices in the United States. This period was known as the Great Depression. Countries across the whole world were affected, but the USA felt it more than most. Every single state felt the after effects of this. More people were living in poverty than ever before. Saying that, perhaps I need to do a full video on the Great Depression because I always reference it in my videos, but I've never done a whole episode I can refer people to. Maybe that's something to think about, but I digress. People across the USA were desperately trying to find ways to earn money to pull themselves out of this hole of poverty. And one of these people was a man called Columbus Marion Joyner, who was known as dad to pretty much everyone. Dad was a 70 year old oilman who since 1927 had been drilling for oil in Russ County, East Texas to little avail. He was something called a wildcatter, somebody who would drill these exploration oil wells in areas that weren't previously known to be oil fields. It was basically taking this huge risk and hoping it would pay off. Because as we all know, there's a lot of money to be found in oil. Most people thought dad was crazy for drilling in Ross County, that he would quite literally never strike oil there, but for some reason he was convinced that he would. In 1930, he began drilling on a farm about eight miles west of Henderson, Texas. His first two wells there were unsuccessful, but then October 3rd, well number three struck gold, or struck oil. It might have even been September 3rd, sources do differ on that, but it was definitely sort of autumn time 1930. Almost overnight, this very poor area of East Texas boomed and became the oil capital of America. The farm on which this oil had been found became America's newest oil field, and thousands of men and their families from across the state, across the whole country, jumped on the chance to be among the first people to work these fields and benefit from their wealth. You need a lot of different people working on oil fields. You need rig men, geologists, pipe fitters, engineers, managers, and more. There were so many job opportunities to be filled here. So people just flock to this area, and when there are people, there's a demand for things like food shops, clothing shops, restaurants, new homes, new schools. This area, struggling with depression like the rest of the country, suddenly found itself pulled out of this hole. No matter who you were, you could profit from this oil. Nearby to the new oil field was a small place called London, but just one year later it would change its name to New London because of some sort of bureaucracy thing. Another county had established a US post office station called London, so the town had to be the one to change its name. The population of London swelled almost overnight to over 1,000 people, and companies from across the USA started to move their employees into this area. And not just oil companies either, all sorts of businesses. And of course, when a population swells like this, you're gonna need more schools. By 1931, London School opened for business, but with 85 first graders stuffed into just one room, there weren't anywhere near enough books and desks for the student. So they brought in more teachers, paying them double the standard salary, and that same year, they purchased a huge amount of land for a new 21-acre campus. 
In 1932, two architects were approved to draw plans for a new 1,000-pupil junior-senior high school building, with no expenses spared. This school cost the equivalent of millions of dollars today to build. They had the newest of everything. They had a fully equipped chemistry lab, a massive auditorium with balcony seating, an industrial arts workshop, a lighted football field, which was the first in East Texas, and so much more. Any child was going to be really lucky to attend such a school. The enrolment numbers actually proved to be so high they had to add to these original plans, constructing additional buildings like an elementary school and gymnasium. The main building though was this junior senior building and if you were looking at this from above it was in a capital E shape with three wings coming off of one straight structure. The building was two stories made of steel and concrete designed in a California Spanish style with a very distinctive red tiled roof. Importantly for this story, the school was built on sloping ground, so from the front it looked single story, and this also meant because they were trying to level the school out, it had a large amount of dead air space underneath the building in the crawl space, 64,000 cubic feet of dead air space to be exact. Now I said that there were no expenses spared in the building of this school, but perhaps that wasn't entirely correct. There was one area in which they did try and save themselves a bit of money, and that's in the heating system. The architect's original plan for the school called for a boiler and steam heating system. However, the school board overrode this decision, deciding instead to stall 72 gas heaters throughout the building. This required gas lines to be run underneath the school, which was not accounted for in the original plans. This meant that the basement areas underneath the school, which would have contained all of the gas piping and electrical lines for this building, were not adapted to provide proper ventilation. This accident, this explosion, was quite literally an accident waiting to happen. Up until the 18th of January 1937, the United Gas Company were the ones who supplied natural gas to the school for use in the heaters, but on that day, the school board decided to cancel their contract. Instead, they opted to have local plumbers tap into the residue lines of the Parade Gasoline Company. Previously, the school board had been spending $250 to $300 a month on gas, about $5,000 today. But tapping into these residue lines meant they'd be getting gas for free. This was a huge saving that had huge consequences. Now this does sound like a dodgy practice, getting gas for free, that doesn't sound right, but this was something that was commonly done across East Texas at the time. Tapping into these residue lines and basically leftover gas was a frequent money-saving practices for buildings both residential and business. It wasn't something that was explicitly authorised by the local oil companies, but it was something that was done quite a lot, it wasn't illegal. However, unbeknownst to everyone, it seems the gas lines weren't connected properly, allowing gas to slowly leak into the crawl spaces beneath the school. Now, you're probably wondering how nobody could smell this gas. Gas has a very distinctive rotten egg smell, right? Wrong. Naturally, gas has no smell. That pungent gas smell that we all know to watch out for is actually added to natural gas in order to make it easier to detect. So things like this disaster never have to happen again. In fact, the reason it's even added gas all over the world now is because of this disaster, but we'll get into that later. So for weeks, there's an odourless, colourless gas slowly leaking into the crawl space or basement area of this school. This is literally a ticking time bomb and nobody has a clue. In hindsight, there were some clues that something was going on. Multiple students have been complaining of headaches, nausea and stingy eyes, but nobody made the connection to a possible gas leak. It was the 18th of March 1937 when everything came to a head. That afternoon, there were about 500 students present in the junior senior school, along with 40 teachers, a number that was actually a lot lower than it usually would be. Students from the first through to fourth grade had been let out early, and the following day, classes had also been cancelled due to an interscholastic meet that was happening in nearby Henderson. Most of the younger students, who wouldn't have been necessarily in the junior-senior building but would have been sort of milling around on campus, were already heading home or already at home, but there were some who were still just milling around waiting for their parents. There was a PTA meeting in the gymnasium, which is a separate building about 100 feet away from the main school building, and many of the parents were finishing in there whilst their kids waited outside, some of them even waited inside the junior-senior building. Meanwhile, in the main building, just after 3pm, the rest of the students were getting ready to finish for the day, just casting their ballots to the school election before they planned to leave. 
the school day will be finishing very soon, so you can imagine they're all very excitable, ready to go home. But then at 3.08pm, disaster struck. No, some sources do say 3.17pm instead of 3.08. In the wood shop, located in the basement, the shop instructor Lemmy Butler turned on a sanding machine just a couple of feet away from a partially open door to the crawl space where gas was unknowingly leaking. Plugged into a power socket, Lemmy turned on the sander and a spark must have formed, immediately igniting the gas surrounding him. A flame shot through the crawl space underneath the building, 253 feet long and 56 foot wide, and then it exploded. Witnesses would report seeing the walls of the school bulge before the roof exploded upwards and then immediately crashed back down to earth. The main wing of the building was instantly destroyed and hundreds of children and teachers were buried in the rubble, brick, steel and concrete. It's said that the explosion was heard as far as four miles away and a two-ton concrete slab was thrown 200 feet, crushing a car. The parents, mothers in the PTA meeting in the gymnasium felt the ground shake with the impact of the explosion and they immediately rushed to the crushed main building on their hands and knees moving the rubble to try and reach the children inside. Within 15 minutes, news of the explosion had been relayed to the main town, although they'd all heard the explosion anyway. Within minutes, residents had started rushing over to try and assist in any way they could. Workers at the local oil fields were immediately released from their duties so they could go and head to the school with their equipment to try and clear the concrete and steel. You can't move that with human strength alone, although parents very much were trying. Very soon after, the governor, James Allred, declared martial law and sent the Texas Rangers, Texas National Guard and Highway Patrol to the scene. Doctors and nurses and medical supplies came over from whatever hospitals could share. Embalmers came as well, knowing they were going to be dealing with a lot more casualties than survivors. In the next couple of hours, you had assistance from deputy sheriffs from all local towns, the American Legion, Boy Scouts, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, as well as all the oil field volunteers and residents. There were so many people there just trying to help. Workers began digging through the rubble looking for the victims, keeping an ear out for any noises from survivors. At this point, nobody knew what would cause the explosion, whether or not something was going to happen again. They didn't care, they just wanted to save the children. In these early hours, rumours flew around of a dynamite bomb being the cause, but nobody knew anything for sure, and like I said, they didn't care. London school bus driver Lonnie Barber had just left on his route, taking the elementary students home when he heard the explosion. Lonnie had children of his own in the school, but knowing the dangers of stopping and turning around with a bus full of kids, he continued on his two hour long route before returning to look for his own children. He had four of them. Three of his children would survive, but his son Arden sadly died. There were well over one and a half thousand rescue workers and volunteers who literally dug through the rubble with their hands, removing the bodies of anyone they could find. The workers wouldn't even take the time to check if these bodies were dead and alive, they were just desperate to get the people out. Any body pulled out of the rubble would be placed alongside some fencing to the south side of the school, where it was up to medical professionals and surviving teachers to assess each victim, see if they are alive or dead, and get them sent off to the relevant place, the hospital or the makeshift morgues, which any nearby building had been turned into. New London didn't have its own hospital, but in nearby Tyler, there was brand new Mother Frances Hospital due to be opening the following week. But after hearing of this explosion, staff were all called in a week early. There were only 60 beds in this relatively small hospital, but 100 children were brought in, many of whom were seriously, seriously ill, suffering with head injuries and internal bleeding. And they were the lucky ones. It became the responsibility of the principal, Troy Duran, to identify as many bodies or victims as he could before they were taken away, so that whatever parents could be notified, who had of course descended upon the scene in a panic. And the parents weren't the only people there, it's said that as word of the disaster spread, thousands of cars blocked the highways into New London, some people trying to help, but others were just curious and just wanted to see what was going on. Journalists, of course, also descended down on the scene, with one of the first to arrive being a university graduate, freshly assigned to the Dallas Bureau of United Press International. His name was Walter Cronkite. Walter hitched a ride to the site with a fire truck that came in from Beaumont, Texas, and he was astounded at what he saw. 
Walter would go on to serve as an anchorman for the CBS Evening News for 19 years throughout the 60s and 70s. He became a household name and was even named at one point the most trusted man in America. Over the course of his career, he would report on a number of huge events, the Nuremberg Trials, the Vietnam War, the assassinations of JFK, Martin Luther King Jr, John Lennon, but he would say of his journalism career, I did nothing in my studies nor in my life to prepare me for a story of the magnitude of that New London tragedy, nor has any story since that awful day equalled it. Most journalists that turned up to simply report on this tragedy were instead immediately put to work. One, Felix McKnight for the Associated Press, was sent to a skating rink that would be turned into a morgue. A doctor gave him a bucket of formaldehyde with a sponge to sprinkle on the sheets covering the bodies. There was no time for journalism, they needed help. As the evening went on, floodlights were brought in and the rescuers worked through the night in the pouring rain. As the hours went by, they knew their chances of finding survivors was getting slimmer and slimmer, and it wasn't just full bodies they were finding either. The larger pieces of rubble were removed by machinery, but smaller rubble was placed into peach baskets, so people could carefully sift through them to pull out body parts, chunks of flesh, bone fragments, toes, fingers, arms. The explosion had caused many bodies to literally fly apart. Within 17 hours, all victims and debris had been taken from the scene, but identification of both survivors and the dead was ongoing. These makeshift morgues were set up wherever they could, churches, garages, even a local roller rink, and when these were full of the dead, the bodies started to be transported further out, to Overton and Henderson, the bodies taken in whatever vehicles had space for them. It's reported that one bread truck driver passing the scene stopped, threw out all of the baked goods in the back of the van, and instead filled it with bodies. The Texas funeral directors very quickly jumped to action and they sent 25 embalmers to the site and to morgues to help with the sudden influx of bodies. Although the surviving teachers tried to do what they could to identify bodies, at the end of the day it was up to the parents to identify their children. Parents had to travel between all of these morgues, lifting white sheets in the hope their child wasn't the one underneath. But if it wasn't their child, where were they? Were they still trapped? Were they missed in the debris? And of course, a huge amount of the bodies weren't in any fit state to be identified, heads were destroyed, crushed under debris, bodies were bloodied and bruised beyond recognition. Because of this, many victims were misidentified. One boy was identified as dead, only to turn up as alive. Three days later, by midday on Sunday, most of the bodies had already been prepared for funeral, except for one girl who remained at the American Legion Hall in Overton. Her body was so beyond recognition that just nobody knew who she was. Through the process of elimination, it was determined that she was Wanda Louise Emberling, although she had originally been identified as Dale May York because of a scar on her toe, and she was even buried as Dale. Once identified, each body was tagged, but it seems like this tag on this body had fallen off in transport, hence the confusion. Because the body had been crushed under a large slab of concrete, Dale's relatives hadn't been allowed to view her body before burial, so they didn't know any better, they didn't know it wasn't her. It was only once more darks had been put in a row that it was realised that this body couldn't have been that of Dale's, that instead it was likely Wanda. To check, the body was exhumed and Wanda's mum identified her daughter through red toenails, which she had painted with red crayons the night before the explosion, and Wanda was correctly buried. Dale's body was soon also found and she was buried next to her brother who died a few days after the explosion from his injuries. As I'm sure you can imagine, funerals were constant in New London over the coming weeks. The humble oil company paid in full for so many of these funerals, sometimes there were three or four every single hour at the local Pleasant Hill Cemetery where the majority of victims are buried. This is one of those things you just don't think about when it comes to a disaster like this. Most funeral homes don't have enough stock of caskets, coffins for something like this, let alone children's size. There aren't enough workers, embalmers, funeral directors, pastors to hold this many funerals. It's absolutely unprecedented. The exact number of dead out of this disaster isn't exactly known, but it's thought that out of approximately 540 people in the building, about 298 people died. Many more were injured, only 130 people escaped serious injury. 
We don't know the exact number of victims here for a couple of reasons. Number one is that so many bodies were completely destroyed, being there just wasn't anything left to identify as a dead body, as a person. But also due to the fact that a lot of families just picked up the bodies of their children and moved on immediately away from the site of all their trauma. There was also a fairly high number of immigrant families in New London at this time, mostly Mexican families, and it is suspected that a lot of these just picked up their children's bodies and may have returned back home to bury them according to custom and tradition. This was 1937, record keeping just wasn't what it is nowadays, but it is thought that 298 is around the correct number of victims. It definitely won't be less than this, but it may well have been more. There's a Texas Monthly article from March 2007 by Katie Vine called Oh My God, It's Our Children, and it shares the stories of many survivors on the tragedy's 70th anniversary. Of course, I'll leave it linked down below, but I do just want to share a few of the stories here for you. WG Bud Watson said, I was in shop class, which was on the first floor with about 30 other boys. It was getting close to quitting time and I was doing some welding in the front of the room when our teacher, Levy Butler, must have pulled an electric switch to get a machine to work. Next thing I knew, I was picking myself up outside the building. Next thing I knew, I was picking myself up outside the building. I don't remember flying out the window, but the building was still coming down. Margaret Nichols, who was in seventh grade at the time, said, I had a headache that day and I'd gone out to my uncle's car to lie down in the back seat. I guess I was asleep when a boulder came through the front windshield. All of a sudden, I was covered with dust. William Follis said, After I came to, several minutes after the blast, I started helping the rescue workers dig kids out. Right in front of me, there were three little girls wedged together. They had mortar dust caked in their eyes and noses and mouths, and all we would have had to do to save them was reach down and pull the mud out. I knew the kids. One looked up and said, save me. 30 or 40 men were trying to dig them out completely. I watched them die. Later on, outside, I spotted one of my best friends who was still alive, but it looked like someone split his brains open with a hatchet. The rescue workers weren't always checking to see if kids were alive or dead. They were just getting them out. One girl was completely twisted around. The poor thing. She was trying to cover herself up because she was exposed. Everyone was working just like they were in a daze. Nobody said anything. This next one nearly destroyed me from Fran Van Assen, who was in the fifth grade. My throat was so dry from the dust that I tried to get across the street to a lunch place where I thought I could get a drink, but the ambulances and cars were racing across so fast I couldn't get there. I sat down beside a car and leaned against a tyre and watched the bakery and cattle trucks unload so they could help carry children to hospitals and morgues. It seemed like I sat there for an eternity. My dad had been looking for me in the room where I had class and found a girl with a foot hanging off who was wearing a dress that was similar to mine, but he noticed she had on black patent leather shoes and he knew mine were lace-ups. Finally, someone told him where I was waiting. He said that every step he took toward me seemed like I was taking two away from him. That's just a few of the stories. There are so many more that I really would urge you to go and read. And these are the survivors. Imagine living with this trauma for the rest of your life. It's said that in the aftermath, once the children went back to school, there was a memorial service held and then it was never spoken of again. Parents told their children not to ponder on it, to not think about what was happening, that it wasn't going to change anything. This feels like a very silent generation slash greatest generation response to me, very much a buckle up your boots, get on with it kind of response to this great trauma. Many of these survivors wouldn't have had the chance to really process what had happened to them for many decades, but there's no doubt that this level of trauma would sit with you every single day. Whilst the emotional and physical trauma of this would be felt for a very long time, the authorities had to jump into action. They had to find out why this had happened and what they could do to stop it from ever happening again. By noon the day after the explosion, the military board of inquiry was ordered to meet, whilst at the same time, members of the school board, oil company officials and military authorities were ordered to inspect the ruins. Official inquiries began just three days later with the United States Bureau of Mines and the state of Texas both sending in experts to the scene to investigate, which was a bit tricky because of course the entire scene had been cleared in the 17 hours after tragedy had struck. They had to get the children out, they couldn't leave the scene as it was. But it didn't take a genius to work out what had happened. 
They found out about the cancel contract with the United Gas Company and the subsequent attachment to the natural gas lines very quickly. It was concluded that the connection to this gas line was faulty, allowing gas to leak into the school unnoticed. The electric sander switch is believed to have caused a spark that ignited the gas which travelled into the dead space underneath the school and boom. This was all published in a preliminary finding on March 27th, so just nine days later, by Texas Inspection Bureau's H. Oram Smith. Smith would also say that this faulty construction was due to a lack of supervising power, a lack of city ordinances being relevant in New London. This was an unincorporated area of Russ County due to it being so new, and therefore it kind of fell through the cracks when it came to checks and balances. It was suggested that state laws were needed to tackle faults like this in places like this. State laws obviously covering the state as a whole, meaning nowhere is exempt, even unincorporated areas. There's never been a confirmed reason given for the cause of this leak, they just assume it was a faulty connection, because the evidence was removed from the scene so promptly, but the pipes were probably just not tightly or properly connected. As I'm sure you can imagine, there were lots of bereaved parents absolutely furious with the school board and with the town as a whole. The superintendent, W.C. Shaw, who had a son of his own who died, was forced to resign and flee town because of threats of a lynching. However, no school officials were found liable and nobody was charged with any crime. They hadn't technically done anything illegal by joining the natural gas lines. Regardless, more than 70 lawsuits were filed against both the school district and the parade gasoline company for damages. And honestly, I'm very surprised it wasn't more, but very few of these came to trial. Those that did go to trial were just dismissed by the judge for a lack of evidence. There was pretty much no justice for the parents who had lost their children in the most tragic way imaginable. No one was held liable, they just had to get on with life. But something big did happen as a result of this explosion, something which I have no doubt has saved countless numbers of lives in the decades since. A state odorisation law was passed. This law required malodorants to be added to all natural gas used both commercially and industrially. A malodorant is a chemical compound whose extreme stench acts as a temporary incapacitant. It basically stinks enough to make you pay attention to the fact that something is wrong. The compound most typically used for this is called mercaptan, of which you only need a very small amount to odorise the gas. It makes it smell like rotten eggs, that gas smell we know all too well. This legislation passed in Texas law on May 17th, 1937 and became immediately effective, requiring malodorant to be added to natural gas. Nowadays, this is a law all around the world, slowly coming to effect over the next couple of decades. All of this on the back of the new London school gas explosion. Had somebody been able to smell the gas leak in the basement, chances are that this could have been avoided and nearly 300 people wouldn't have died. And there were other laws that came into action as well on the back of this. There was the Texas Engineering Practice Act in 1937 that prevents any person from practicing or offering to practice engineering without a license. Then there was the creation of the Texas Board of Architectural Engineers, created to protect the public from irresponsible acts by architects. There were just many more checks and balances in place because of this. I know people love to scream about how the whole world has gone soft nowadays, how health and safety has gone mad, but behind every rule that somebody deems to be stupid or overkill is most likely someone or more than one person that has lost their life or been seriously injured due to a lack of these checks. There are so many moments like this one in history that might be the reason why you're alive and well today. But that comes at a cost, and in the case of this, a particularly high cost. But considering what a huge tragedy this was, this is something that has been kind of lost to the history books. As with so many of the cases and histories I cover on my channel, I only heard about this through your comments. There's probably many reasons as to why this one got brushed under the carpet, but a huge part of it is probably because the residents, the survivors, and the victims' families refused to talk about it for so long. They just wanted to forget. But as the years have gone on and the survivors have grown up, they've realised they needed to talk about it. Over the decades, a couple of documentaries have been made. The 50th anniversary was partially commemorated by the release of the documentary, The Day a Generation Died. In 1998, the London Museum opened up across the road from where the school had once stood, where a now rebuilt school now stands. The museum creator was Molly Ward, who had survived the explosion herself. 
In March 2012, survivors and others gathered at the rebuilt school for the 75th anniversary and slowly more people are talking about it, more people are sharing their story. It's painful but these moments in history do have to be shared, they can't be lost. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.